see a pretty um, concise and tight little class tonight. So um, again, uh, as I, I mean, I think that you guys are kind of getting the gist that the Carnegie hours are totally in effect here. That you're getting a lot of you know a lot of time outside of class to work on things you need to work on to make those uh, superlative models of uh, of uh, the projects uh, encompassing all the learning and all that good stuff. So. Um, I mean, not that I want to get out of here early, it, you know, being summer and all that. I have a six-day summer vacation. I'm extremely I'm like right in the middle of it right now. I'm on day two of my six-day summer vacation, so just living the good life, living a good life. Um, so uh, t tonight we're going to talk about um, – it's, it's, it's going to be a little reach over from your uh, 514 class. Um, since only Nadia had me, you'll be getting kind of my perspective on using video in education, but the specific thrust and crux of tonight is on flipping the classroom, um, a term that, you know, as I, as, as I, you know, have taught, uh, use this as one of my full nights of teaching in 515 over the last two or three years, uh, started out with nobody hearing it. Now most students have, 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 have at least a passing, uh, glance at flipping the classroom. Is there, have you all heard of the term? have a light understanding at least of what it is. I've got a nice little uh, less than two minute video with penguins and a walrus that explain it very well. Um, it, it kind of fits that in a, in a, in a class tonight where we are uh, focusing, putting a heavy focus on using vid leveraging digital video in education that the majority of the page tonight is full of videos. Uh, not all of them we will watch, not even uh a quarter of them will watch, but they're all on there, and I'll let you know kind of the format and what the page, uh, you know, how the page is set up as we move forward. But here's our, our cute little animation um, about flipping the classroom. Somehow I have some music. Oh, I know where that's coming from. Darn that Spotify. Here we go. Let's quit you. All right, here we go. This is a classroom. The teacher stands at the front and the students watch and listen. You'll recognise this because it's probably how you were taught and how your parents were taught before you. But there are a lot of problems with this approach to teaching. You see, not all students learn at the same speed, so some get left behind. And while some students learn better by listening, others may learn better by doing. This means that teachers can't always do the best job they can, but there is another way. The flipped classroom addresses these problems and makes learning more personal. First, the teacher makes a video that delivers the content they usually teach in class. Then they share it online with students who can watch it before the next lesson. This leaves the teacher free to spend class time leading activities that help students apply the knowledge. Students can rewind and rewatch a video as many times as they like and come back to class with questions for the teacher. So keeping up with the class is no longer an issue. Students can access the video at any time using mobile devices, giving them the ability to learn more independently. Instead of sitting and listening, students can spend class time applying knowledge in more practical ways. And teachers are free to spend their time working with students and giving them individual support and attention. The flipped classroom model is already making a difference to students and teachers worldwide. So get involved. Discover more at flippedinstitute.org and become part of the movement. I wasn't lying, it was cute, right? Yeah. A little origami. South Polish animals um, enjoying that. So yeah, the, the ultimately the idea of flipping class is that the you know in, in the traditional structure, classroom lectures take place at home while the work, the actual meat of applying knowledge, happens in the classroom instead of at home, frustrating um, uh, parents uh, insanely. As a you know, as as my kids, you know, having kids growing up in a system where you know they would send them home with homework and without any context, and a lot of times. My kids came home saying, I, I, "We didn't do this in school today. I don't remember this." So you know, I'm I'm thrust into the role of teacher at home, and um, of content that I'm not even really familiar with on Common Core worksheets, math worksheets that you know are are 
impossibly um, frustrating using methods, mathematic, mathematical methods that I didn't learn when I was a kid, and, and my, my multiplication division isn't good enough to get the job done. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a frustrating thing, but as a parent, you know, if you're, if you're at home with your kid and you're able to watch a video at home with them of, you know, whatever the content is, then you can have rich discussions with your kids about what they're learning and, you know, th that it, it really kind of flips the script on, um, on, on that whole frustrating process of, of homework and what homework is and does, is homework essential and does it really apply to what's happening in class? This is, if you're flipping class and you're having students watch videos at home, you're really um, investing yourself in homework that means something to what's happening in school the next day and the days after that. And um, so just kind of in a nutshell, uh, that's flipping the classroom. Um, I embedded here a, a just um, the, the most recent um, robust statistics on flipped learning are two years old. I'm hoping that they're that they're doing it again. I know they did they did a big round of of uh, statistic gathering, information gathering in 2012, and then again in 2014. So it being two years after that, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to see uh, what some what some of the statistics are now, but but the statistics are pretty are are you know they they they're they're pretty uh, fall they fall pretty much in favor of flipped learning in a, in a big way. Um, just kind of looking at some of them, not really going to I'm not going to read directly from this thing. That would be um, insanely boring. But 96 96 percent of teachers two years ago at least recognizing the term, up from 73 percent two years prior. Um, the number of teachers who have actually flipped a lesson increasing from 48% to 78%. And of the, well, those that did do it, 96% say they would recommend it to a colleague. Okay, all grades in, in 2012, 95% middle and high school, while in uh, 2014, 15% um, grades K through five. So we're starting to see an uptick in lower grades and also 27% in higher ed, so we can see a lot more of that happening in, in, at the university level. And just really in all subjects. So, um, you know, the majority of, of, of the classes that we're flipping were in the, in the STEM read, were in science, math, technology, but, you know, and, and still the majority of those numbers are here, 38% in science, 33% in math, but now we're seeing language arts, 23 computer science 17 so we're seeing an, an uptick there even two and a half percent in PE so what you know what does that look like and then you know it'd be interesting to it'd be interesting to see some flipped PE lessons almost five percent of teachers said they had flipped their special ed classrooms and over 11 percent of teachers are receiving their professional development via flipped learning which is awesome okay because I don't know I, I don't know how many of you have spent time in professional development sessions just being talked at okay if I could if I could sit and watch whatever learning they needed me to to swallow before a full day of actually hands-on work that would be awesome I would do that every time so the for me where the where the rubber hits the road here is with students okay nine out of ten flip teachers indicate that student engagement improved okay which echoed previous research uh, Increasing student engagement and class participation in 2012, they found an 80% increase. 71% um, of teachers also reported an increase in student grades, okay, um, and a change in classroom culture. All right, um, I'm listening. I like to say I'd like to say I'm reading, but I'm not listening to a book right now, um, and uh, it's it's really kind of focused on on how school needs to change, how the, the, the real crux of, of why change is needed. Um, for some reason right now, it's, it's not in my head, but it's uh, Tony Wagner and Ted Dintersmith. Uh, Tony Wagner is a, a kind of an edu hero. Uh, Ted Dintersmith was this, uh, he was this, um, uh, what do we call the guys that are like uh, super money guys? 
Uh, I'm just, I don't know. Come on. Guys that are really, okay. What's that? An uh, on entrepreneur? On a huge level. Here, I'm going to find out. It's, it's like a really, you know, a word that's very common. He is a, he's a venture capitalist. Thank you. A venture capitalist. So Ted Dinter Smith, he's, he basically um, had, he, he, this guy made, you know, tons of money as a venture capitalist, millions and millions of dollars, and then saw that his kids were just getting beat down by the education system and bas basically stopped being a venture capitalist. And now he's, he's an advocate for changing education. Um, you know, his story is his story's quite a bit more uh, robust than that. But he hooked up with Tony Wagner, who's uh, written some, some of the most cutting-edge books on why education needs to change. And they together wrote a book called Most Likely to Succeed, which is also a documentary that it premiered at Sundance last year and is now being shown around all over the place. And it's, it's just this really intensive book on why education needs to change. And the model of education that we currently employ is the same model of education that has been employed since public education started um, about 140 years ago. Okay, it's exact, the, exactly the same ideology, exactly the same pedagogy that, that is being employed now that was basically come up with over 100 years ago. Whereas everything else in our society, in our world, has changed and shifted completely. And yet we're still educating kids by grade, in silos. Uh, the idea of, you know, kids, even kids that are in AP classes, they, there's a, well, they mentioned one really high-powered school that at the end of the school year, there were, these kids are kids that earned fives on their AP exams, you know, were just, you know, top flight students. They tested these kids at the beginning of the, the following school year on the exact same material, except they took out a bunch of the harder stuff. And the, the average score was, I think, like 56%. So kids are going to school. They're succeeding, in quotation marks, and then they're not learning anything. Right? They're, they're learning to, pa to pass tests. They're learning for a grade. They're memorizing facts and, and discrete information, but they're not really retaining any of that information. So there's no real learning taking place except learning how to work a system that benefits a very small percentage of, of our students. Okay? They're, they're basically hacking the system. It's a system that says you're supposed to learn this stuff, and they're saying, I'm going to cram all this information in my head. I'm going to memorize it for a very short period of time so that I can get an A in this class and that I can pass get a 5 on the AP test so I can go to whatever college right? I want to. And there are kids, there's a super small percentage of kids for whom that is a viable outcome. All right. And so we're, we're at a point in our, in our history in education where what we're doing in schools isn't working. Okay. Where it's just, it's, it's not working. If, if you have the opportunity and you just want a summer read, I know that you're all, none of you are super busy this summer and you're just kind of taking this class, you're auditing it for the heck of it because you know, you heard great things about it, but the book is called Most Likely to Succeed, and um, man, it is, it, it, it'll it stir up some righteous anger and like hopefully impact the way that you teach in the classroom and the way that you look at things. So, and one of the big parts of it is, is there's no connection between between homework and what we're doing in the classroom. It's just kind of added work. And the, the, that old line of, well, we give kids homework because it teaches them grit and perseverance. And, you know, they, they, they you know, that's, yeah, I'd rather have them out there playing, uh, inventing games in the dirt with their friends and that kind of stuff. But in any case, um, we're seeing much more student engagement for students in flipped classrooms because they're having short videos they watch. And then they come to school the next day and they're actually doing work with that information. Okay. They're actually using that information for something. Only 5% of teachers have their students watch a video every day. Okay, so once, once you have kids watching videos every day, that's more like that homework for homework's sake. It's like, has to be legit, has to be real, has to be there for a reason. Okay, 20% uh, of uh, almost half, one to two times a week, 20% four to five times a week. Um, 
34% use video less than once a week, with 5% never assigning videos, yet still consider themselves to be flipped educators. Okay? Which is kind of an interesting concept. You dig up the information at home, and then you bring it to class and do something with it. Okay? And then 9 out of 10 teachers who currently do not said they would be interested in learning more, up from 83%. So, um, you know, this is... This is one of those things. So in education, we get these things that come up all the time. And it's like, it's, it turns out to be kind of a flash in the pan. And that's flip learning could have been that, but it's not. It's kind of here to stay. And some teachers are using it really well and really innovatively. Other teachers are using it just to kind of drone their videos at home. And, and some teachers are using it in really cool ways. Um, you know, I consider, I consider what I do for this class kind of a modified flip and that I record everything I do. And then I just pop it on the website for people who don't make it to class, for people who, uh, you know, if you need to refresh on something, oh, damn, he said something like two hours into the class. What was that thing? Go back and check it out, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's not really flipping, but it's kind of utilizing a screencasting technology to, as, a, as, as a resource for students in the class. Okay, so um, it, is, it is a phenomenon that is is basically here to stay for the, the foreseeable future. Um, what that winds up looking like as, as the methodologies behind education continue to change. I know I mentioned either the first or second night of class that, I mean, we are, we are like right in the middle, of, we're in the eye of the storm right here. Like we, we don't know which, you know, how this education thing is going to play out right now. You know, it's, we have this, insanely disruptive technology, the web, that has all of the information that mankind's ever known and ever, you know, and, and ever will know because it's constantly updating. And st every student has access to that information. Okay, so all of my thing, you know, my, you know, if I'm a history teacher and all of my knowledge about history, a student can look up on their smartphone when they want to. And they don't necessarily, they don't need to listen to it coming out of my dusty old mouth. That's, you know, we're, this is where we are. But the, that's still, in a lot of ways, how high school is being taught. And that's definitely how college is coming at you. So um, things are going to have to change. Okay? Because we're, we keep falling further and further behind in these, this standardized test race against countries who, for whom that's all they do with their students is crush them with standardized test prep. We'll never catch up to South Korea. We'll never catch up to Singapore. Okay? Well, that, that's, that's just a losing battle. It's kind of ridiculous. We'll never catch up to China. As a matter of fact, those countries are sending people here to figure out how to make their kids more innovative. Because all their kids are, are able to do is go work in, you know, go work in factories because, you know, like China is, is in the middle of an industrial revolution, much like the industrial revolution the United States experienced in the early 1900s for which the educational system, that's why the educational system was set up. We needed students that could get to a place on time, they could follow instructions, they could do things on time. We needed, you know, kind of automatons because that's the worker that was needed at that time. That worker is not needed here anymore. That stuff's all being outsourced or, or it's being um, given over to, given to machines, right? We don't, we don't, that's, that's, we need creatives. We need people who can think on their feet, who can critically think, who can collaborate, and that kind of stuff can't be gauged on a standardized test. So at some point, we're going to have to figure that out, right? Or we're going to have we're going to have a bunch of people who we're going to have kids that do well on standardized tests, go to college for four years, and then are on then are like they're well educated debtors who are working, you know, at Starbucks or in a mail room. Or we're going to have you know people who don't do well on standardized tests and are going to be you know we're, we're going to be basically funding them through our taxes. You know, it's a serious, they're going to have like this weird caste society where, um, you know, there are going to be very few people with a lot of money and a whole lot of people with none. And it's coming directly from our educational system. It's a, it's a pretty scary time in education. And it's a, it's a, it's a very important time to be a teacher who understands the heartbeat of, of what education needs to be in order for our kids to be viable commodities in the future. Okay, and, and all of the things we're going through in this class kind of, they, they connect in different ways to this. Okay, so the idea of just creating flipped lessons to do things like 
they've always been done is is not the idea. It's it's figuring out ways to innovate and and how could how can we take something like the flipped classroom and make it a reality in our classrooms and actually utilize it to have kids working on real things in the classroom while they're pulling information outside of the classroom. Okay, so as we as we kind of go down the road of of how you do it, how you flip class, I mean if you've all, the majority of you have taken 514, and in 514 you learn to make video. So if you were to think about it, that, you know, here I have this class with all this content that needs to be taught, and I gotta create a video for every single thing I teach in order to flip my class. That's not realistic, right? I mean, just there's just, there's just no way. The great thing is, is that there's tons and tons and tons of video already out there on the web. I, I mean, I am a, I am as huge a proponent as video that's already been created and stealing what other people, other smart people have done than anybody. I mean, there's, I probably have 40 videos on this page, not one of them made by me. Okay. I have found videos from other people that can tell the story, that can, that can give the information that I can utilize and leverage for, for my own teaching opportunities. Okay, so this first section is on video that's already been created. All right, and so what I wanted to just share with you are a series of, of YouTube channels, um, websites that house and contain uh, video that's already been created. Okay, the, num the, the number one used site for flipping content, for sharing, uh, content is Khan Academy. If you haven't heard of Khan Academy, um, I'm glad you come out of that rock that you live under just to come to this class every week, right? It's pretty ubiquitous at this point. What um, the the kind of new element that's that's happening right now with um, Khan Academy is that they are they are now eliciting other people to make videos for Khan, and they're they're branching out of simply mathematics. So if I were to go, and, and these are all links up here, so if you just wanted to link right to their YouTube channel, they're the, you just, just click on the, the link there. If you go to Khan's YouTube channel, um, you'll, you can see now that if I go to their playlists, that they now have not only the things they had before, microeconomics, statistics, all the algebra, geometry, but now we have American civics, history, cryptography, healthcare, astronomy. They're, they're, they're branching into some different areas. And their welcome video on the homepage of their channel has uh, Khan Academy now looking for people to come help create lessons for U.S. government classes. Hi, I'm Sal, founder of the Khan Academy. And I'm Kim, Khan Academy's U.S. History Fellow. And it being July, the month of our nation's birth, as well as an election year, kind of uh, not so exciting election year, uh, we thought we would excite to spice things up a little bit uh, by creating uh, a crowdfunding campaign to sponsor American history and government content on Khan Academy. The goal is to answer all the questions you might have about our history and our government, anything from what's an executive order to how the Supreme Court works. But to make it happen, we need your support. Uh, it will help you learn. But even more, it will help your fellow citizens learn so that we can have a deeper, richer, and more spirited democracy. So help us make history at Khan Academy with our very first crowdfunding campaign to create education by the people for the people. So Kim, you've got a PhD in American history. So crazy. I didn't actually realize it was a crowdfunding campaign. So they're actually going to the people. I'm gonna, I wonder if they've... Uh... Did you? I wonder if they've uh, if they spent all of their Gates money. Gates gave them like millions and millions of dollars. But here's here's kind of what this is this is what your millions get you with Khan Academy. So if you if you've ever, never been to their website, okay, Khan Academy has not only a YouTube channel, but they have their own website. And that the website is not only a place to to get their videos. But it, it all it also is a, it has a full management system behind it, where you can assign kids work through the website, and it 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 not only teaches them but assesses them as well. 
there are uh, quite a few districts now that are utilizing um, Khan Academy as their mathematics curriculum. Okay, where you could come in and see, and I haven't, I used to, um, I used to be an independent study teacher before the job where I, where I am now, and I, the, since I'm not a math teacher, um, I would actually, I assigned, put kids in, so this is kind of my, my leftover, the leftover classes I had from two years ago. But you can, you can actually assess, and I'm not actually able to do it here because it's, uh, let's see, activity from forever, all time. There we go. So I'm able to kind of look at, at student work, and I'm not sure how well you can see that. Let me zoom it up here a little bit. I can actually look at, at these discrete skills and see if students mastered them. So it's, it, it, it's basically they've built a whole and robust system behind their, their content. Which is which is a pretty a pretty cool thing to be able to look at um, the work that kids have done in there. It gamifies it a little bit. They can they can earn uh, points, then they get to change their little their little um, avatars from a leaf to a to like a leaf with feet to live to like a plant and then a tree and you know they could there's all kinds of uh, different ways to interact with it. So it's it's kind of a it's kind of a neat thing, but you can see in here that there's all kinds of, uh, you can do it by grade, by subject. They've got science and engineering, art and humanities, economics, computing, and they have a full test prep series. Okay, so if you're taking the MCAT, you can go for a full test prep program on Khan Academy. So it's, it's and this is all free, all uh, you know, for the people, by the people, sponsored by, like I said, Bill Gates uh, gave them a bunch of money, but they're they're a nonprofit, and now they're trying to go for the uh, the civics run uh, with uh, money that they want from the public, and they'll get it. I mean, there's a lot of people that that definitely support that, but the basics, the basic behind Khan Academy, and the reason that the reason that um, I appreciate it so much is that it is it is pretty bare bones. Okay, they're, they're, you're not talking about these just these like insane um, production values going into Khan Academy videos. If I so this is this is one of those types of mathematics that my kids brought home that I was like on because I just had no idea lattice multiplication. I know how to multiply. I don't know how to lattice multiply. And now Khan Academy has a full has a full lattice multiplication video. So now I if this if they had this back when my kids were bringing it home then I could have actually saw this video. It's actually a pretty new one. But it's just him talking and writing out problems. Right here, 48, down the right-hand side, and we draw a lattice. This is why it's called lattice multiplication. So the 2 is going to get its own column. The 7 is going to get its own column. The 4 is going to get its own row. And the 8 is going to get its own row. And this is... 98% of the videos that are on this site are just this. It's this guy who is a, you know, he's a computer scientist, a, you know, great mathematical mind, and it's just him explaining mathematics in short videos. And he started out, you guys know his story? He started out by uh, his cousins, he was working as a computer scientist. His cousins, his younger cousins, who lived in, I think, Houston or something like that, were having trouble with math, so he just made these videos and put them on YouTube for his cousins to watch, and pretty soon noticed that his videos were getting thousands and thousands of views. And, I mean, that was, that was, the, that was the open door to Khan Academy. Hey there. How are you? Good. And, I mean, now, you know, uh, millions of dollars later in in nonprofit money. I mean, they've got a, they've like I said, there's there's entire school districts that are utilizing the 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 Khan Academy uh, system for teaching and learning mathematics. It's pretty wild. Um, 
and just, you know, the, the power, that's kind of the power of leveraging video in education. Uh, this one I thought was cool because it's not him. I, I, this is the first Khan Academy video I've ever seen that is narrated by Sal Khan. All right, so we've been talking about the later stages of the American Civil War. And in the last videos, we talked about the Battle of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Address, which happened in November of 1863, as Abraham... Okay, but still pretty sparse. Black background, using colored uh, electronic pens to uh, write out information. But it's, you know, it's, it's at its basis, just, you know, very strict and... and uh, straightforward tutorials. At the other end of the spectrum is Crash Course. And if you've experienced Crash Course before, Crash Course also has their own full YouTube channel. Hi, I'm John Green. Welcome to Crash Course. Okay, and you all know how much it costs to have a YouTube channel? Free. Free, yeah. Free. So, I mean, think about it. If um, you're, you're creating these videos, it doesn't cost you anything to put them on the internet, it doesn't cost you anything to have a channel, um, and you are um, basically putting all this stuff out there. Crash Course, again, a couple of, a couple of teachers put together these videos, and these videos are, are a little different, I think, than... Then Khan Academy. A box, a ring, and a marble, and they're all at the top of a ramp because you know how physics loves ramps, especially hypothetical ramps. So let's say this ramp would allow for static friction but not kinetic friction. Now you let go of all these objects at the same time so that the box starts sliding and the ring and the marble start rolling all at once. So which of them will hit the bottom first? So the answer might not be what you'd expect. I mean, we already know that when you drop two objects from the same height in a vacuum, at least they'll hit the ground at the same time even if you tried it with a feather and a bowling ball. So you might think that all the objects would get to the bottom of the ramp at the same time, but they won't. And the reason has to do with how energy is distributed in an object when it's rolling. And in order to understand who wins the ramp race and why, we have to investigate some qualities of rotational motion, specifically torque and the moment of inertia. Okay, we're not going to learn all that tonight. If you want to learn that on your own, it's on there for you. All the way to the railroads. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course World History, and today we're returning to a subject that could have a Crash Course series all of its own, the Industrial Revolution. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, are you going to do a whole series on the Industrial Revolution? Because that actually sounds really boring. Yeah, I mean, for the past, no, I, I'm a little bit busy. I've got this movie that's about to film, so yeah, no, but uh, we are going to... Got these little animated guys in the background here. ...the central slice of the Industrial Revolution that also, like, pleases my four-year-old self a lot. Railroads! <laughs> We're going to be talking about a small book by Wolfgang Schiebelbusch called The Railway Journey. So in this Crash Course World History series, we're talking a lot about a lot of different history books so that we can... So this one utilizes this guy, uses utilizes, utilizes images, video, and then the animation that Crash Course is, is really known for. So, um, you know, a lot of... There's a lot of different elements being put together here to try and hold the attention of a kid, right? And as you went through 514, that was one of the things that you shot for, I, I would imagine, in your, in your videos that you created was, you know, how do, how do we utilize all these different resources to make something that may or may not, hopefully will, uh, grab the attention of a kid so that they might learn something. You know, we've got a lot of competition, especially when it comes to YouTube on uh, grabbing kids' attention. And so, you know, there, there are some, some sites and some uh, YouTube channels and some teachers that are really, really utilizing that kind of multimedia bent to grab kids' attention. Then you've got the straight up, like, academic stuff. So this guy, Paul Anderson, he I don't think he teaches there anymore, taught at a school in Montana called Bozeman High School. And he started doing his science videos um, and okay so this is a 14 minute tour of a cell which 
Really? Yeah, because she never thought of it before. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, and it is. It's his his videos <laughs> are. Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to take you on a tour of the cell. We're going to talk a about teacher, types of cells, and then teaching, structures inside a cell. Okay. First thing, though, that we need to and 14 minutes. The reason cells are small is that material moves into a cell through a process called diffusion. So oxygen gets in that way, and carbon dioxide is going to move out in the same way. So there's 14 minutes of that. So you think about think about a kid sitting at home, watching that for 14 minutes. Just watching it. How many other things is that kid doing while that video is on? So it would take a long time for material to diffuse. Right? This them. is the first thing that happens. So what we can do is we can actually make right? the Yeah, I can tell you they would still take notes. They don't do more than videos. I agree. The distance the material has to be made, especially in this. I think they'd be small. Yeah. And uh, you also might think to yourself, so, I think you can be small. Here's, so here's, this, this brings up, and again, this guy is a, a, a very knowledgeable teacher, okay? He's created hundreds and hundreds of science videos, and he's gotten better at it. So this, this new one here on, wave, on physics and wave speed, it's less time, six minutes, which is way better than 14 minutes. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is He's got kind of the green screen thing going on now, so he doesn't have the little, he's not in a box now. He's got the outline of his head there on the black background, and... You know, AP Physics Essentials, video 107, it's on wave speed. If you spend any time in a thunderstorm, you know that the light reaches you much quicker. Than that integrating sound. little video, his production is, is really cool production. But again, how do, how do you ensure that kids are coming to school the next day with the information that you want them to come to back to school with? with a video that is just kind of pure information. That's that's going to be the thrust of of where where we're getting tonight and how we how how there are there are ways to to kind of make that a reality, different ways to do it, kind of to break up these videos. I had to throw the I had to throw a, an artist's YouTube channel in here. I'm more Siendai brings in um uh, discussions on great priest Great pieces of art. All right, cherubs. We're looking at Bob Kelly's. Calls everybody cherubs, which is nice. It's kids' cherubs. Signs and characters. The central figure is, of course, Venus, or if we're being Greek about it, Aphrodite. She is the goddess of beauty, whose gentle laugh to distract the most focused of men and make the women the most clever. This painting is telling the tale of her birth from sea foam. Sea foam that, as the mythologies inform us, was mixed or fertilized with the castrated genitals of the god of the sky. This is a classic story of beauty rising out from muck. Okay, good stuff there, yeah. One of the better uh, and, and cooler um, sites for already created video comes from TED. So we know TED, TED Talks. We're not going to watch any TED Talks tonight. But uh, TED also has an education website. So where TED is ideas worth sharing, TED Ed are lessons worth sharing. And uh, one of the cool things that TED Ed does is it takes teachers who have really cool lessons and they match them up with um, with animation when, with professional animators who then animate those lessons. Okay, so you get really cool videos. Like an almost five minute video on Sherlock Holmes. More than a century after first emerging into the fog bound, gaslit streets of Victorian London, Sherlock Holmes is universally recognizable. Even his wardrobe and accessories are iconic the Inverness cape, deer stalker hat, and calabash pipe. And figures such as his best friend and housemate, Dr. Watson, arch nemesis Moriarty and housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson, have become part of the popular consciousness, as have his extraordinary infallible powers of deduction utilized in the name of the law, his notorious drug use, and his popular catchphrase, elementary, my dear Watson. And yet many of these most recognizable features of Holmes don't appear in Arthur Conan Doyle's original stories. All the way from, uh, from Sherlock Holmes 
to the threat of invasive species. Massive vines that blanket the southern United States, climbing as high as a hundred feet as they uproot trees and swallow buildings. A ravenous snake that is capable of devouring an alligator. Rabbit populations that eat themselves into starvation. These are horror movie concepts, they're real stories, but how could such situations exist in nature? All three are examples of invasive species. Organisms harmful not because of what they are, but where they happen to be. Okay, so we've got these videos that are all on YouTube and they're all free and they're all cool. Um, one thing though that the TED Ed site does is it puts them in kind of a usable lesson. So that if I want to jump in and create a lesson around a video, I can do that. So here, how the choices you make can affect your genes. Let's view the lesson. Okay, and they are put together in a way that allows you to watch the video and then think about the video using um, some multiple choice questions. It gives us an opportunity to dig deeper, to find different resources and go to different resources to, to go for a little deeper dig. And then it also gives uh, guided discussions and, and open discussions to, uh, to, to go further. And it also allows you as a teacher to take this lesson that's already been created and to customize it yourself within the framework of the TED Ed site. So as a teacher, I'd be sending my my students to the TED Ed site and actually having them con do the lesson inside of that site and then I would be able to see how they did via the classroom that I set up on the site so utilizing utilizing this framework in in TED Ed requires me to have an account and to put together a classroom there so that I can assess kids uh, as they watch one of these videos yes it is free, yeah. So here's where we start making making what stu what students do with these videos. It gives it, it we we it, this is a kind of an opening of a door here for us to be able to see if kids are actually interacting with these videos and what I can expect as a teacher the next day when kid comes in when a kid comes in after wa after watching a video for homework. You know what I mean? Because I don't. I'm not super concerned with, oh, you didn't watch that video, you didn't earn a grade. I'm concerned with, I have a plan, I have, we have plans in class tomorrow to do stuff with that information. And if half of my class comes in not having watched that, right, then I can't realistically move on as a teacher with whatever plans I have to have kids do stuff with that information. Right, That's re that really becomes our job now as teachers. In a world where information is ubiquitous, I'm no longer the key holder to all the information. I am the key holder to helping kids figure out what to do with information. But if they come to the classroom without that information in their heads, and, that, and we've got a plan to utilize that to, to, you know, to create a video, to do some sort of a presentation, to collaborate on some kind of a project, Whatever that, whatever it is that they're going to be doing with that information the next day, how do I know that they actually have it? Okay, and with something like this, I can assess that. If they went through it and they answered the questions or, you know, participated in, this, in a discussion, I can go in and look and see how they did to kind of assess, you know, do, does my whole class know what they need to know before they get in here? And that's a pretty cool thing. And these videos are, are, are actually put, for the most part, put together in a real interesting way. I mean, they, 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 they do hold your attention. And the great thing about each one of them is, I don't know, this one is five minutes long. They're all around five minutes long. And really, that's, that's kind of the sweet spot for making any, for any kind of flipped content.
is 50, is five minutes or so. I mean, we're, we're, we're competing in a lot of ways for students' attention, and five minutes is a good time. You know, you make, you make a video on a tour of the cell that's 14 minutes long, and you're losing kids. They're just not going to watch it unless they're really into it. Okay, so this TED-Ed site's a great resource. It gets bigger and badder every time I jump back to it. So kind of following that idea of, of, of shrinking down the content into chewable chunks, uh, Minute Physics is a good one. This guy started his, um, his, his site with videos that were literally only a minute long, but he's expanded it to, you know, like two, three, four minutes, depending on the video. What happens if an immovable object meets an unstoppable force is a popular question on the internet. Of course, relativity clearly tells us that there is no such thing as an immovable object. Here's why. If you pick any supposedly immovable object, or just something like your house or the earth, I can make it move. All I need to do is start moving relative to it. For example, I might ride a rocket, and suddenly from my perspective, I'm not moving and the earth sails by outside. The laws of physics make no preference for inertial framework. Okay, so if you were to give this video any kind of critique, what would it be? It's very fast. Okay, it's very fast. It's, it's attempting to explain something fairly complex very quickly. Okay, that's fast talk right there. What happens if an immovable object meets an unstoppable force is a popular question on the internet. Of course, relativity clearly tells us that there is no such thing as an immovable object. We could always... Why? If you pick any supposedly... We could always force slow it down. Or just something like your how... But... Yeah, this is super, this stuff like this, while it's completely engaging, is super challenging for kids. It just goes too fast. And while the quickness adds to the entertainment value of it, kind of needs to go fast, just because of the kind of video it is, for, for actual learning of content, it's, it's tough. Okay, it would be nice if I had, if I, if I had some ability to kind of either not slow it down necessarily, but stop it at certain points so the kids can have an opportunity to reflect on what was just said really quickly. You can. Oh man, you just you just told you just gave away the punchline. No, it's okay. It's perfect. Our sun and the earth and all the planets and moons and dwarf planets and asteroids and comets, the solar system in short formed about 4.6 billion years ago from a nebulous cloud of swirling gas and dust, which coalesced thanks to the irresistibly... Okay, so minute, minute physics full of cool uh, science videos that are, that are um, marker animated. Okay, it's drawn, drawn with a marker. Uh, we talked about Hippie's history uh, probably first night. Um, I, he, he's the guy that just kind of cracks me up. But again, his videos, while he's a little hipper than Paul Anderson of Bozeman Science, his videos are also pretty long. So you want to know about the Russian Revolution? He's got a 21-minute video on it. Hey, guys, welcome to Hit Hughes History. We're so glad that you made it because I got a little pot on the stove here, the Russian Revolution. I'm going to cook you up a meal of learning. That's right, guys. Big ideas, context, vocab, things that anybody can understand. Certainly this isn't gonna write your historical research paper for you. You're gonna to have to do a little bit of more of the learning and the reading, but we certainly think that we can get you the basics. So when you sit back with your feet up, get a drink, because I think I hear the train of learning coming. Did you stop it at the station of now? He's obviously using what technology? All right, so I would start- He's green screening, yeah. Yep, he's got he's, he's total green screen. He's got a little cartoon classroom behind him. Uh, any pictures and things that he brings in behind him, yeah, it's all green screen. So he's he's doing um, a lot of talking. So I mean, this is this is twenty one minutes of him talking, mostly like that, right? But he he so he does a lot of talking. But yeah, he's also doing a lot of editing. <laughs> 
after this after the fact, right? So any anything that comes in behind him is all is all done in post production. Um, I know for I I just know because I I I kind of know him. He does all of his editing in iMovie, so he's just just use the green screen feature in iMovie, and he just brings in whatever whatever he needs images he needs behind him, just drops it in using iMovie, which is which is you know as as you guys know is is not super challenging to use, right? What's that? I didn't know there was a green screen. Yeah, there is. In iMovie? In iMovie, yeah. When we took the 514 class, uh, he showed an app that you can do it. I, iMovie on your, on your um, laptop, not on the iPad. Yeah, but um, how does that work then for a green screen on your computer? There is in... I have an app. Well, there, there is an app that... that uh, I forgot the name of the green screen app, but... Um, but in in iMovie itself, there is a if you're editing, I think it's under the crop tool. Okay, let me open a different project. Ah, I don't remember where it is right now. It's yeah, but it's. It's okay. I can do it. Yes, there you go. Thank you. It may only come up when a when a certain type of uh, clip comes up, but. Yeah, there's a there's a full green screen function in there, super easy to use. I I promise you. Okay. Nope. Now green screen in iMovie. There we go. If if you if there's ever something you need to know, there's a young British guy who will teach you how to do it. That's that's the rule of the world, yeah. No, seriously, they're always British. And there you go. Version ten. Classic. So there's the video of me with the green screen behind me. We're then going to move to the area or part of the video where it's kind of going to turn around and there's going to be uh, the effect is going to kind of come into play. So I've split the clip there. The next job you kind of will place the part of the process you want to do is you want to find the clip that you're going to be using to overlay. In this mm -hmm. case, it's going to be the file. You drop it in on top. That's why I couldn't find it. It has to be a clip that's above. Your other clip. Just there at the moment. That's not going to be very permanent at all. Okay, we'll move it down here for the moment. The next thing you want to do is you want to always make sure that when you are. Man, we got you there, buddy. So, now you've got the two side by side. And what you'll notice is that on any other video, there is only eight options here. Nine options, sorry. There's only nine options there, but when you actually use the, the green screen, you have the green screen video on top of or overlay, you will find there's actually a tenth option mm -hmm. just here. This tenth option will give you a video overlay setting. So you've got the cutaway, 
the green or blue switch will, will be using, the side by side, or the picture within the picture. So for this instance, we're going to be using the green and blue screen, so we just click on that one there. Fantastic. And as you can immediately see, there is fire behind me. It has indeed overlaid. So as you can see, we'll run through the video. There we go, talking, 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 and then... One of the best things about your green screen is when you use a cloth for your green screen and you don't iron it. He's got that background behind him, but he's, yeah, he has all the awesome folds in his fire. So if you ever use cloth for your green screen, make sure that it's ironed and that it's not sagging anywhere because it'll look, it'll look bizarre. But in any case, yeah. So yeah, in order, in order to get that green screen, uh, the, the overlay feature up, it had, you have to have, you have to have a, uh, a, a one video clip over another video clip. You have to have basically two layers of video and it opens up that, the overlay, um, tool. Okay, so we've got there's a there's a ton of content on YouTube. So let's just say okay, so these are channels. These are people who do it all the time. But if I were to just go to YouTube and say like you know, if I'm teaching um, multiplying fractions in my class, the same way that I would do for myself if I wanted to learn something, I just put in multiply fractions in here, and I'm going to find a ton of different resources that show me how to multiply fractions. And so I can literally utilize any anything from the internet, right? Everything everything that someone if you put anything you put on YouTube, right, is usable under Creative Commons license. As long as you're not out making money off of it. Right? If I, I can I can utilize any of this for my classroom. I can put any one of these videos on my website. Again, as long as I'm not making money off of someone else's work, I'm good to go. So whether it's, you know, math, this guy at Math Antics doing his video on multiplying fractions. Everybody likes their math wacky, so here it is. You probably noticed that we've been talking an awful lot about if I have a problem, what is 12? Okay, if I, let's say I wanted to utilize that video. Let's say I wanted to utilize... Everybody loves a good math rap. Okay. It doesn't get any. This is amazing animation and rap math. Okay. There's a. There's so much content. There's so much content. You know, let's say we're doing, something in eighth grade science. I'll just type in eighth grade science and see what comes up. The science of waves, a video lesson from. Away from it. Waves transfer energy. They do not transfer matter. The wave will actually move through the matter. Okay, this is nine minutes. Let's say, I only want four minutes of it. What do I do? The matter usually goes right back into place. Unless, of course, it's in the case of an earthquake. If you do that, whereas, yeah. Dang it. You can embed it into the iMovie. Yeah, you can do, um, what is it, YouTube MP3, and then code, put this code in it, and then you can steal it. You can also steal music from it. Yeah, I mean, you can borrow it and not give it back. It's okay. We can call it stealing. I'm going to throw away all this stuff. Okay. Um, there's this great little tool. Okay. Let's say that I want to utilize this video in my classroom. I want to embed on my classroom web page just part of this video. There's this neat little tool called TubeChop. Called TubeChop. Okay, I go to TubeChop, and I just grab the address of this video, the URL. I bring it over to TubeChop, and I enter in the URL here, and it brings up this video. I can then take TubeChop and say, I want to start at 209. I want to end at 507. 
and then I just chop it. And it now creates a video that starts at 209 in that video and ends at 507. So now I have a three minute video of just the content that I want. You can't like pluck out the first two minutes and then the last four minutes kind of thing. It has to be a, 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 a consistent chunk of that video, right? But then if you look up right here, it gives me a nice little embed code. I just grab that embed code, throw it in my, web, in my website and done deal, okay? So that gives me the opportunity to utilize other people's video, but just a part of it. Even though you know if you gave your kids just the whole video and said, I want you to start at 207 and I want you to stop at 509, they would all completely follow those directions and, you know, and, and make, it, make it happen exactly the way you, you wanted it to. No, it wouldn't. They'd watch the whole thing or they'd watch everything but the part you wanted them to. You know, all those, all those things that, uh, you know, this way you can actually really define what you want them to watch and uh, for how long you want them to watch it. Point is, there's tons of content on YouTube, and there's all kinds of ways that you can disseminate it to your kids, okay? So the, the, fact, that, um, the fact that you can't, that, you know, if you don't have time to make all this video yourself, it, it shouldn't stop you from leveraging and using digital video in your classroom you know, to, if, if, if you want to. Okay, so this week's community discussion has to do with YouTube content. Um, anything from the YouTube channels that I have above or anything that you find in a YouTube search that you want to utilize, I want you to share the link to that in our Google Plus community so that you're sharing the video there. And then just a quick comment on why you chose it and how you could use it. Okay, that's, that's for our community discussion for... Um, for our, our Google Plus community. Are you guys okay with uh, running class the way we did last time with just churning through all of our stuff and leaving to handle those Carnegie hours on our own? Are we going to need a dinner break tonight or we we just carve right through it? All right, so lots of content out there. I mean, more more than you can handle. As I was as I was putting together the the, the web page, there's one thing I didn't get to. It's this watch no learn that I found just kind of at the end of this thing. There's 71. It says they've watched 71 mil, people have watched 71 million videos on this site. I'm, I'm assuming it's not different ones, but it's kind of a, a an organized collection of YouTube videos. So if I, you know, drill into it, I've got a directory here of, um, of subjects, content areas. And then I also have broken into um, grades here. Okay. Um, I, I haven't taken a good look at this yet, but, you know, if I jump into language arts, and it looks like I've got some discrete areas here. If I go into reading, we've got subcategories in reading. Let's go into literature. Okay, and there, a four minute video on Thoreau and it's on Vimeo. Okay, so I mean there's you just just know there's a lot of different ways to find resources. We just we just looked at YouTube, but Vimeo's in a Vimeo's probably the and it's not even close to YouTube, but it's probably the second most popular video upload site. A lot of the ones on here are are a lot of, a lot of the videos on Vimeo are ones that are um, a little more um, elaborate. Uh, a lot of people who make short uh, movies, short film, uh, they upload straight to Vimeo. There's all kinds of interesting things on Vimeo, but um, that's the cool thing about this watchnolearn.org site is that it, um, it actually draws from various sources, not just YouTube. So they have 25 different videos on using reference skills. 
how to use a dictionary, how to use an encyclopedia. Oh, dictionary rap. We love our raps, man. That was that was a big hit. That was big stuff not too long ago. Corny old white people rapping is the best. So we got to get going to talk about our friend Noah. Not Noah. Wow. Okay. I didn't say they were good. I just said they're there. Which brings up a whole other cool discussion on, on you know, as a teacher, you are, I mean, you now become like this consumer of, there's so much out there, right? And it might, you, you know, it might be, you might want to just say like, you know, if I'm looking up the, the fraction ones, right, let's go one back, you know, you, you kind of always gravitate toward the, the first one or the first two. It, it really pays to watch them. You know what I mean? You don't know what kind of maniacs out there putting multiplication videos out there, right? You want to make sure you watch it and make sure it's actually uh, breaking down the, you know, the, the content that you want it to break down. Okay, and now you become not 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 a creator of video, but a consumer, a vetter, right? Like you have to vet like the best the best video for your kids. You wind up white mind up white mind up might wind up watching you know six seven ten different videos on multiplying fractions before you find one that connects that you believe will connect best with your kids. The cool thing there is like let's say you know that I find that this does. I look down here and I see, you know, this, I like this video a lot. It really works. My kids really respond to it. I go down here and it's from some, you know, the, the, the account is by someone called Math Meeting. So then I go and I check out Math Meeting. So Math Meeting has its, has a full channel with all kinds of stuff. And now I can start looking at, you know, in their basic math section, they've got seven and six is 13 and another 16. You know, they got 29 videos on here of, you know, all kinds of different, uh, you know, basic math videos. They also have geometry. And, I mean, so, so you're starting now to get, you know, a way to drill in deeper. Okay, and then the other cool thing is whenever I go to somebody's... Um, somebody's channel page, I get over here on the side related channels. And there's Math Antics and there's Ted Ed and there's Khan Academy and Math BFF. You know, I mean like I don't want to subscribe to you. I just want to go to you. I might want to go to Math BFF and there's my BFF and she's all mathy. Right? And so maybe maybe now this becomes something that, you know, so so there's there's ways to find to dig your way through YouTube to find great resources. And if Math BFF doesn't do it. Oh, look, I like her little thing that's a heart squared. I get it. That's cute. But maybe I want to go like, oh, here's Prof Rob Bob. And I'm going to go here and see like what this guy does. And oh my gosh, he's all chalk. And maybe I dig chalk and my kids dig someone who's at a chalkboard. And so maybe this, this connects for me. And so you can just keep drilling into, and he looks totally mathy, that guy, with his National Sarcasm Society shirt. Right. But I mean, so, so there's, there's just no, I mean, there's so much out there. Right. And all you have to do is dig through it all. So let's now move on to talking about creating your own content and a, a few different tools for creating your own content. Um, in, in your, um, the 514 class that you guys took, did, did you all do it? Across the hall, did you do it with with Tori? Okay, huh? You right, right? You moved from there because it's yeah. Um, did you guys talk about um, whiteboard apps for the iPad and integrating that into your? No. Okay. Okay. We know the basics. Enough said. I enough said. I got you. I got where you. I'm I'm picking up what you're laying down. All right. So um, you know the iPad is just this like fantastic tool for and and it just kind of it's kind of made for putting together your own little lessons. 
Um, and I've got here a series of apps uh, laid out here that are kind of fall into that the category of what we call a digital whiteboard app. And um, a few of them are free. A couple of them are it will cost you money, um, not too much. But um, what they allow you to do is to create tutorials, tutorial videos. Hi, welcome back to Code. This is Mr. Joe. Tonight we're going to take a look at another example for our condensation reaction. Um, let's uh, take a look at our ingredients first, and then go ahead and name them as well. <clears throat> um, let's take a look at the one on the left. Since there are four carbons, one, two, three, four, this will be um, a group. And since it's got carboxylic acid, so this is Okay, so not super exciting, right? But, you know, it's very, very succinct, two minutes and 37 seconds. It's obviously going through an example in, in an organic chemist, some sort of chemistry class, and he's breaking something down for his students, right, to assist them in some way, shape, or form in a very quick and easy way. Okay, he's got his iPad out. He's pre-written pre in the you know the the title of it and then part of the drawing for it and now he's kind of going through the 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 process of just kind of hitting up his his digital whiteboard while he's explaining over the top of it so now as a student this is huge for me because when he's up at the chalkboard or whiteboard in class and he's doing it or he's up at the smart board or whatever he's whatever he's doing in class to show me this stuff I may or may not be paying attention, you know, but committing something like this to a short video, I can go back and read that. I can move forward and say, okay, what is he doing? Like I can, I have, I have the power of as a student to move around in this video and do, you know, use it in whatever way helps me the most. It actually turns, it, it gives the student the power to kind of use the video that you create in whatever way they want to use it. Damn, I wasn't paying attention in class, but now I have it here and I can keep looking at it. I can figure it out by playing it and replaying it, and then oh yeah, I just need to replay that little section. Or, you know, I can watch the whole thing. It's a you know, it's it's a very it's a very nice tool to be able to, you know, especially in this in this realm here, to be able to just like go through problems with kids. Especially in the idea, like if I have a kid and the kid emails me if I'm a math teacher or a science teacher, I don't really understand this problem. And if I'm a diligent teacher, then I, you know, I, my phone will alert me if they get an email on my, in my teacher account, on my teacher email. And if it's a kid, then I can say, oh, you know what? I'll make a video on that real quick. You check it out on YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel in about 10 minutes and there'll be the answer. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll put a little help video up there for you. You can just kind of crank out a quick help video on that and do it in, in your digital whiteboard uh, app and, you know, share it with the kid. Show me is really the most basic one. So that's, these, are apps, right? these are all these are all iPad apps. Show me is the most basic one. It's free me. OK, so it's, you know, free to download the app if you want to. I think where the EMEM comes in on this one is you have to pay to open up the functionality of being able to like download it to your camera roll or something like that, I believe. Um, as it is, there is a show me site. And on the show me site, yeah, so there's a whole pr premium price and feature thing. But if you, the one cool thing about show me, so here's another way that, you know, you can utilize elements that other people have created is that on the on the show me website you can come in and say okay I want to see what show me's are out there for grammar and here's someone that did a show me on indirect objects and I can actually take a look at this show me And it's kind of not good, but let's say I thought it was good. I can go ahead and hit the share button, and I can just, there's an embed code for it. I can embed it on my site. 
You know what I mean? Or if I don't want to make one myself. Okay, it's a it's an app, right? But if you're I think I have mine in here. Okay, but you can always, you know, you can bring in pictures and stuff. So let's say you were doing one on prepositions. Press record. And you can see my little timer on the bottom. Today we're gonna talk a little bit. about prepositions and right so those only popped up there because I had you can put multiple slides on there and so I already had a slide in there that had the the dog in the dog house and so you can in order to show what prepositions how prepositions work I have uh, my dog Buster here there's Buster and Buster is the subject Okay, and the, over here, I have Buster's house, and his house is the object. And basically what prepositions do is they describe the relationship that this is horrible. the subject has with the object. It's horrible. We're going to talk about the relationship that Buster has with his doghouse. And when I say relationship, I don't mean he's dating his doghouse. I mean that Buster is going to do different things in and around his doghouse. Okay, and the prepositions are the words that tell us okay. where Buster We don't have to watch that all then. That's really bad. So, but it does allow you just kind of to really quickly and, and succinctly make your own videos. Okay, and all of these tools that are listed on the website here are all different tools that allow you to do that. To different degrees and with different capabilities. Uh, probably the, the most, ro not probably, the most robust one of those is Explain Everything. I think Explain Everything is like three bucks, uh, but it has a whole bunch of tools. You know, you, you can bring up web pages, you can, I mean, there's all, there's a whole lot of different things that you can do in Explain Everything. I've taken a photo. Um, of a triangle, an isosceles triangle, and I'm asking this before, I'm just going to prompt them to actually the angles. So you can take pictures, move them around, both of these angles, play here. around with them, point at them, write on them, and zoom you know, in, all that stuff. So you can see all the stuff this guy is doing and explain everything. You can do a bunch of slides, bring in, bring in worksheets, they can and, actually uh, use this little digital, this this image of a protractor as an actual protractor. So kind of what I've done here with these different apps is I've put on the left hand side a tutorial of some kind and then on the right hand side I've, I've put in a little example of some kind. So Doodlecast Pro is another one that's uh, it's a pay, it's a for pay um, app and I think it's like five bucks. Uh, Shadow Puppet EDU. This was pretty interesting. It doesn't have anything to anything whatsoever to do with Shadow Puppets. I'm not really sure why they call it Shadow Puppet EDU, but um, but it it's another kind of digital whiteboard. Uh, this one's actually pretty neat. This is if I were you, this is the one I would check out first. Is Shadow Puppet EDU again for, totally free and just kind of kind of an, a, an interesting take on the tool. And then there's Doseri, which is I know the one that's probably the most popular with teachers and students. I know a lot of teachers that are assigning their kids to create their own doseri little lessons or to use doseri to to sh to show their learning. This is just kind of a, I like look, seems like someone made like a little music video out of what you can do with Doseri.
Kind of a weird song to put behind it, but And I'm not sure if it was a teacher or not. There were a couple of really uh, interesting um, misspellings in there. But in any case, um, yeah, it, it is. It, I think it's probably the most popular one right now. That might be another one for you to check out. But just um, just know that for for part of your project for this session, uh, you will be asked to create a video using one of these. We'll talk about that in a couple couple of you. Okay, uh, screencasting. Uh, Screencast-O-Matic is the screencaster of choice. Have you all used Screencast-O-Matic? Okay. Screencast-O-Matic is very, it's what actually what I'm using right now to record this. I have the pro version, which is um, one of the best deals in, in broadcasting. It's uh, 15 bucks a year and um, it allows you to take as much screencast time as you want. So screencast is basically uh, you recording what's whatever's happening on your screen. Okay, so the, you know what I'm doing right now. I'm just talking and I'm going through whatever's on the web page, showing you guys examples, all that stuff, and so that's all just being recorded. Okay, um, you can use, uh, you can make screencasts of things that are very, you know, kind of pointed and discreet. Like, I want to teach you how to do this one thing. It's on my, it's on my, the screen of my computer. It's in this web browser. It's in Microsoft Word. It's wherever it is. And I'm just going to do a quick screencast. All right. The cool thing about Screencast-O-Matic is that it's free. If you don't want the pro version, it's free. And it's, um, the only, the only thing about the free version is it doesn't let you save them. Which is fine if you're just going to upload them to YouTube. Uh, you don't have to, you can just upload yeah, you can just upload them right to YouTube, and um, and you have a maximum of 15 minutes of recording time. Okay, which we've already talked about. If you're if you're doing making videos for students, you don't want them to be more than five minutes most times because it's just you know, yeah, short attention span theater. So, um, but the the great thing about it is, and I don't know if I can actually make this work while um while I'm actually using my pro version, but I'm gonna go ahead and try. If, um, if I click this button and I disappear, it's because I caused some kind of a rift in the time continuum, so. Oh yeah, it's not gonna let me. It's gonna bring up my, my pro version here, okay. So basically what it will do is it will, it, it, see this, this little tiger striped frame that I have around here. Down on the bottom of here, there's a little pause button and there's a timer. Okay, it'll basically create this little tiger stripe box on your screen that you can size however, whatever size you want it to be. And then it'll just, it'll just give you that opportunity to record what's on your screen. You just press the record button. It gives you a countdown from three to one and then you're recording. And as long as you're going until you press pause, which I'm not going to do here, Okay, it, I, it'll be fine if I did, um, but it, once you press pause, it'll ask you. You'll, you'll, it'll bring up a little a little menu, and then it'll have a button that says done. And if you're done, it'll send you another page where you'll be able to watch your video if you want to. And if you're done with it there, then you can you have a choice. You can download it to your computer. You can upload it to YouTube, right? It just won't save it in Screencast-O-Matic. So you need to actually do something with it when you're done with it for the free version. So you can upload it right to YouTube or download it to your computer and then upload it to YouTube. If you wanted to incorporate a screencast into your into a bigger video, you can download it to your computer and then pull it right into iMovie. You know what I mean? So there's there's ways that you can utilize that screencasting. But you know, basically anything that you want to do uh, that you want to share with somebody else, something you want to teach somebody, right? Then you know, you can, you would screencast it using Screencast-O-Matic. The other cool thing that happens automatically in Screencast-O-Matic, I don't know if you've watched, um, 
I, I, I don't know why you wouldn't. They're so gripping. The videos that, um, you know, that I create for our class um, at the at the bottom of our of our web page. So if I go all the way down there and I jump to one of these, let me make sure, sure the sound's off so I don't hear my voice. You can see that anytime I move my cursor, come on, buddy. It gets a little yellow ring around it so you can follow it. Screencast-O-Matic does that automatically. So any video that you create in there, anytime you move your cursor, that little yellow circle will follow it. Anytime you click, it will it'll make like a little red dot that clicks. So it, it, it adds that feature uh, without you even knowing it. That's a really cool little tool. Anytime, you know, it, and I, I use it often for, you know, someone, if, if someone needs to, needs a, a, a quick, like, you know, I'm having trouble making this work or making that work. Weebly's doing this and I don't know why. Then, you know, I'll, I, I, a lot of times I'll just make a real quick little screencastify, I mean, uh, not screencastify, that's the old one I used to use. Screencast-O-Matic uh, video on it, just a quick tutorial, upload it to YouTube, and then send the, the YouTube link in about, you know, I can do all that in about five minutes. So screencasting is a very valuable tool. Um, most often using that for, um, for kind of technical things, like, you know, my Google Drive isn't working the right way. Can you show me how to do this? And I'll make a quick screencast on something in Google Drive. Okay, so another one of the things you're going to have to do this week, in addition to uh, creating a, a digital whiteboard uh, video on your iPad, is you're going to be creating a, a small, a short screencast. Okay? And there's a tutorial here on Screencast-O-Matic. It's actually kind of a cool tutorial. It's, it's, and it, it's kind of, it's, it's very meta in that it's a teacher using a screencast tool to show his kids how to screencast. So that's pretty neat, I thought. The purpose of this tutorial is to teach you how to use the Screencast-O-Matic software and to remind you about the assessment guidelines for the Calorimetry Challenge Lab. So there's some things that he's going to be talking about where he made this, this guy made this video specifically for his students. So some of it, you know, if you use the video, some of it you can just ignore because obviously He's talking to his students and not you. But he does go through in a way that, that makes sense to his students, right? Goes through how to use Screencast-O-Matic, which is, which is nice. Okay, so yeah, this is actually what you'll get right here. So when you start recording in Screencast-O-Matic, it'll spit out this little wireframe. You can choose to have it cast your screen alone or your webcam alone, if all you want is your face. Like if you're doing a vlog, you could use Screencast-O-Matic to just record your face as you went on some rant about Donald Trump or, you know, McDonald's French fries or whatever it is you felt like you had to rant about. Or you can do both. So both is the screen, and then it puts your face in a square in a, in a corner, right? So you can, so they can see that your content and see you. Okay, so you can choose that. You can make sure... Uh, using this, the, the little sound meter that they, that it can actually hear you through the speaker on your, um, on your computer. And you can also choose the, uh, the resolution or the size, 720p, 1080p. So when you upload it to YouTube, you know, you can be high def or, you know, stuff like this. It's good to have it in high def if you're doing, if you're doing a tutorial because then people can actually see very crisply all the words on your screen and all that. If you don't, if you don't do it in good high def, People won't be able to, it, the, the words will be kind of blurry. But it's a good little tutorial there. Okay, so I've like, speaking of, I did the full, um, the full minute physics version of class so far, where I've kind of been talking really fast and, you know, kind of jumping, going through a lot of stuff pretty quickly. Um, but this is the point where kind of done talking about finding video and creating video. So before I move into flipping that video, does anybody have any questions? Any comments? Yes. Oh, we'll get that. Two to four minutes, two to four minutes. Short, short, short. 
Okay, so let's talk about a couple of different apps that we can use to flip our video. Either the video that we create or the video we find. We've got to do something with it now because, uh, you know, honestly, just assigning kids videos to watch at home, uh, it doesn't, it, it, I, it doesn't work as well as it should. So there are apps out there that you can use to, to make sure, to be able to just do a quick formative assessment to make sure that your kids actually watched it and, and understood it. Okay, because when teachers, as teachers, when we just plow forward, making the assumption that kids have understanding, it, it, you know, that's how, that's how a lot of kids can start getting behind. You know what I mean? Especially if you're doing collaborate, collaborative work, group work, you'll have kids that watch and kids that don't. And, and then you get that, that whole paradigm where you have groups of kids working together and some kids are doing all the work and other kids aren't because those kids know it and the other kids don't. So, the, the two apps that I want to talk about are um, Edpuzzle, which was mentioned earlier, and then another app called TAC, okay, T-A-C-K-K, -K. all right, and just to give, just to give a, a, a quick glimpse at Edpuzzle, Edpuzzle is a really neat tool. There are other tools out there like it. There's one called uh, Educanon, E-D-U-C-A-N-O-N, -N, and another one called Zaption, but Edpuzzle to me is just the easiest to use. Um, so this is Edpuzzle, and this is another one of those tools that it's like free, and I'm not sure how it's free, but it's just completely free, not freemium. It's just that's just what they believe in creating something like this for free. In Edpuzzle, you can find wonderful educational videos from YouTube, Learnzillion, Khan Academy, Vimeo, or even reviews in your lessons from other teachers or upload your own. Then, you can make the perfect lesson using Edpuzzle editing tool. You can trim a video and take only what you need for your lesson. You can also record your voice to make a warm introduction or explain with your own words. Finally, you can embed questions during the video to check the understanding of your students. In minutes, you created the perfect lesson, and in just one click, you can assign it to your students. Edpuzzle provides you all the information you need. Who hasn't watched the video? Who doesn't understand the lesson? And who did a good job? Remember, in Edpuzzle, you can find amazing educational videos. Make the perfect lesson in minutes and track your students with hassle-free analytics. With Edpuzzle, you can make any video your lesson. Okay, so really cool tool. Let's take a look at it real quick. Did you get all that? Kind of not the easiest to um, on your computer. There's an iPad app for it, I believe, but it's not it's not um, super robust. The cool thing about it, like like that TED Ed site, is that you can create um, you can uh, you create your own class, and then you're able to kind of look and assess. And that just real quick glimpse, which kids didn't watch, didn't do it at all, which kids, you know, didn't score very well, so didn't really understand it, and which kids did understand it. Okay, so let's say that here I have a, a video on the semicolon. Okay, so here's our... Here's a guy that has that created his own video. Okay, so a semicolon has two main uses. The first is that you can use a semicolon to join two closely related independent clauses in order to make a compound sentence. In other words, if you have two simple sentences that are related and you want to combine them to make one sentence, you can do that with a semicolon. For example, you can show cause and effect with a semicolon, like this. Ryan is terrified of dogs. He had a traumatic experience with one when he was a child. Okay, and I could stop there. I mean, 
is here is that holy? 